get going because we have a full day ahead of us. And one of the things that you will see in the next few weeks um, is we're going to drive a point home and you'll feel it. So we're going to try to fly through um, a bunch of stuff. Um, and I mentioned, I think at one point, that um, the rhythm, there's a rhythm, there's a pattern for life on life missional discipleship in this uh, curriculum or using this structure. And that is that each week uh, what we work through is kind of this schedule or structure, which is truth, equipping, accountability, mission, and supplication or prayer. Everything is covered in prayer. So with that, let's pray and, um, and then we'll dive into it this morning. Heavenly Father, we are grateful to be able to be here today to talk about discipling others and how we have been discipled, who you have used in our lives uh, to disciple us. And Father, I thank you for this church that wants to grow uh, in this regard, in this respect, and I thank you for the individuals that are in this room. I know we're lighter today. I thank you for those who uh, just are, are out of town. I know there are several folks who are out of town this weekend, five or six I can think of off the top of my head. So I thank you for them and uh, pray that you would use this time to encourage us and to instruct us and uh, help us grow together as we think about Life on Life missional discipleship. And ultimately, the, the, the name or the program aside, how you can equip us because you've called us to make disciples, not simply to make converts, but to see people grow from new, becoming a new believer to a mature believer to becoming a leader who's able to disciple others. And so we pray to that end. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, okay, so what, uh, what we're going to do is do a little uh, group project here, okay? We want to see how we can do, we can work together to come up. And if you're sitting in a seat that does not have a scripture verse, will you walk over and just grab one from one of the other seats? Because we're going to need everybody to use one uh, possible. So good morning, Lisa. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to see if we can kind of group think our way through uh, the definition of life on life missional discipleship. So, all right, so I'll, I'll give you some help words, okay? I know you might have it in, somewhere in front of you too, so some cheating is okay in this context. It's okay. So, um, so if we were to restate the definition of life on life missional discipleship, I'll give you the first word, laboring. Laboring in the, can you finish that next sentence? Lives. Laboring in the lives of a few with the intention of imparting one's life, God's word, and the gospel in such a way as to see them become mature and equipped followers of Christ, committed to doing the same in the lives of others. So that's a mouthful. And it can be abbreviated LOLMD, which we will say at times, but it is good to kind of drill into your mind that uh, life on life missional discipleship, because each aspect of it carries weight or carries intentionality. And so today what we're going to do is we're going to do some study on passages that are foundational to this particular definition and why this working definition was kind of come up with years back. It's not the only definition of discipleship, certainly not even the only definition of genuine life-on-life -life ministry that is discipleship in the lives of others. So we don't want to say that. It's the right definition. But it does carry biblical principles that are all valuable and that are all important. So it'd be good for you to commit this to memory. And just uh, once you have it committed to memory, it helps you even in your own daily relationships think of what you're doing in those relationships and how it relates to what God is called to do. So, uh, LOLMD, just read it with me here together. Laboring in the lives of a few with the intention of imparting one's life, God's word, and the gospel in such a way as to see them become mature and equipped followers of Christ, committed to doing the same, in the lives of others. That means our goal is not just to get them to come to church, and that's it. Our goal is not to get them to come to church and then be good people. That would be a misunderstanding of what the gospel is. Our, our goal is what God's goal is. That is to see new believers come to faith, 
and to grow to become mature and equipped followers of Christ. Now, you're going to reach a point as we journey through this class, and certainly as we move forward in Life on Life Missional Discipleship, where we say, why are we beating this same uh, drum all the time? And you're going to get tired of it, and, and that's good. We need to talk about the fundamentals until we get tired of talking about them, and then we know, just maybe, we're beginning to think about it enough. Does that make sense? Uh, so, what are our goals today? Well, number one, we just want to understand a biblical foundation for life on life missional discipleship. And number two, we want to fortify a true conviction that will lead to action. Fortify a true con conviction that will lead um, to action. And uh, you may have um, some spots for those on your notes there. I need to actually see what I like. I have here for you. So, oh no, I don't have that. Not, not a spot for those two particular goals. But so anyway, so so those are our two goals today. Now we've talked about there are different people in this room. Obviously, I'm stating the obvious. Sir, uh, you're here for maybe different motives. Some of you are community group leaders, and there will be tools that you will pick up. Really, um, in about three weeks, we'll start talking about some real three four weeks. Start talking about some very specific tools that you can add to your relationship and discipling tool belt for conversation that will help you uh, in that. You're also learning how, what's the relationship, what's the difference between community groups, for example, and life on life missional discipleship. Not to say one is more necessary than the other. They're both necessary and they accomplish different goals or different purposes. So uh, we're gonna spend the next few minutes working through some truth and here's part of what we're going to punctuate is this idea. Part of what is necessary for this particular structure, the journey group, uh, is everyone will do two to three hours of homework during the week. Okay? Why? Well, because to grow at a certain pace, there is only so much that you can do when you come together once a week and you talk for 25, 30 minutes about an idea and then work to apply it to your life and then leave and then come back and do it again the next week. Now, that doesn't mean you're not studying your Bibles during the week, certainly, but if we're going to grow through the basics of the faith, a broad swath of the basics of the faith, then it requires that we're able to come together during that time in the week and use that time to apply it. We study it during the week, and we come together and say, how does this apply to my life? How do I flesh out this truth, and how does it impact the way I relate to others? And that requires that the study is done largely during the week. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so when we come together in journey groups, we're hitting the highlights of the main idea, right? We're hitting the highlights of the truth. We're not, it's not a Bible study per se. Does that make sense? And so what we're going to try to do, you'll feel it a lot this week and you'll feel it a lot next week. Uh, as Brian and I, I'll be gone next week and so Brian will teach next week. But we're going to drive you through some truths that it, it, we're going to be, like in a few minutes here, we're going to hit the gas. And we're going to try to scream through some stuff that we're trying to get through that we don't normally have, we don't have enough time to really spend the time sitting on it. Does that make sense? So we're, I'm going to keep us moving in a few minutes because I want to get to some conversation in a few minutes where we can break up in groups and talk about some different things. So what is a disciple? Well, we could define a disciple as one who is called by Jesus, one who is has repented and is trusting Jesus for their salvation, and one who is seeking to follow Jesus with their whole life. Now, disciple, in its most general sense, is one who learns from and follows another. But in a Christian biblical sense, a disciple is one who is seeking to follow Jesus with their whole life, and one who is training others to do the same. A true disciple is training others how to do the same. So what characterizes a disciple? Luke uh, 9, 23 through 25. And he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? Loses his soul. And I need to just reset something on this for a minute because... That's what I'm looking for. 
There we go. Um, okay, so uh, in these passages, in your homework this week, you had uh, several passages here to, to look through <laughs> together, right? John 6, 3, verse 8, verse 12, verse 16, 22, and 24. This shows us that, that there were a couple different types of disciples. There were apostles, which we see in John chapter 6, right? So these are the, the disciples here were apostles, which leads us to our next obvious question, which is this. What makes a person an apostle? Right? We hear about the 12, which are, were apostles. And so Acts gives us the answer for that. Will somebody read verses 21 through 26 here in Acts? It's on the screen here. If you'll just read that out loud for everyone. So one of the men who accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men had become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two, Joseph called Barsabas, who was also called Justice, and Met Matthias, Matthias. Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two have you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go on his, to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and a lot fell on Matthias and was numbered with the eleven apostles. So essentially there are three requirements here that we see in this passage, verses 21 and 22, right? It was someone who followed Jesus from his baptism through his ascension. Somebody who followed Jesus all the way through. Number two was somebody that had, must have seen Jesus after his resurrection. Somebody that must have seen Jesus after his resurrection. And then third, somebody who must have been appointed by the Lord himself, which... Which raises the question, well, what about Paul? Paul calls himself an apostle in most of his letters, right? First Corinthians and Second Corinthians, Galatians, Colossians, and Timothy, etc. He calls himself an apostle. Acts 9 gives us that example of where we see, see Paul being called by God, in fact, on the road to Damascus. Remember that? And he's blinded, and he's called, and he's sent into the city to go to this home where he would receive... Uh, his commission. So these are the three requirements. I've kind of jumped ahead of myself here. Somebody must have followed Jesus during his entire ministry, seen him after his resurrection, and been appointed by the Lord Jesus himself. There's a second type of disciple that we see as we read the Gospels. Um, when we look at verse 60 and 61 of John 6, when many of the disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, they said, do you take offense at this? A few verses later, after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went with him. So the word disciple is used in the context of those who are apostles, those who are genuine followers of Christ, but also those who temporarily followed, realized it was a hard call, and then walked away. Does that make sense? So there's a period in which there's this group of people following him. And we've seen this as we've been studying the book of Mark. Crowds would follow him. And as people would come up on a, on a, on a, on a hilltop to listen to Jesus teach, it would seem that those are, were his, his disciples, those who were learning from him, the crowds. But they didn't all stay. Some of them left. Uh, and then in Luke 10, Jesus sends out 72 disciples here. And so... Uh, who else wants to read scripture for me? I've got uh, 12 verses, if somebody would read that for me. Got time. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter first, say, Peace be to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. But if not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide, for the laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick in it and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near you. <clears throat> but whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go into the streets and say, Even the dust of your town that clings to our feet we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come here. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that time. 
This is a fascinating passage. Uh, so what did Jesus tell them to do? Well, let's just summarize a few things. Number one, he told them to pray. He told them to pray. So it follows that as Jesus' disciples, we ought to be a people who are praying. Right? By the way, let me just say, the goal here is not necessarily to give you a new revelation. Oh, I'm supposed to pray, but that's the answer. Right? These are all things that you know. Uh, that we're highlighting as what ought to be foundational for us. He says, go your way, go before Jesus, and greet no one on the road. Now, that is not an evangelistic <clears throat> passage in the sense that uh, we see other places where we're to go and we're to scatter the seed, and we see how the seed is uh, being received or how it re responds to the soil of the heart, right? We're, we are to scatter the seed everywhere, but in this particular sense, he's giving them particular commandments, right? Go, greet no one on the road, carry only what you need. But whatever house you enter, say, peace be to this house. Now, this is a fascinating couple verses right here. Say, peace be to this house. Ma'am. Right. Is this on your any of your sheets I'm looking? Or is I, don't this know if it is. I don't know if I put this on here or not. Okay. No. Okay. Uh, and I'll, I'll stick these PowerPoints online if that'll help you guys too. So, and whatever you say to the peace, I'm sorry, whatever you, whatever house you enter, say, peace be to this house, and your peace will rest on him, basically, if he's receptive. If he's receptive of the kingdom of God, uh, your peace will rest on him. If not, it will return to you. We're, we're conduits for the grace and peace of God in the lives of others. And when that means your, your, your peace, if not, it will return to you, two things we can take from that just at a very, very high level. One would be the discipline and the, the, the spiritual gift of discernment. There are people that you meet that you can sense, and it's hard to always know exactly why, but you can generally sometimes sense if someone has a relationship with the Lord, right? You know, you meet somebody and there's a kinship. Now, I don't mean that you know their salvation, I don't mean that you know their heart, and with discernment, as with everything that is not black and white scripture, we take everything with a grain of salt, right? I don't trust my own heart because my own heart can be deceptive. Does that make sense? Um, and so we want to be careful there, but we are called to be discerning. But taking it a step deeper, what that means is your peace will return to you. In other words, the sovereign Lord will not carry forward the benefits of the kingdom in the life of one who is refusing the call of the Lord. Does that make sense? Right? It's basically saying there are blessings and benefits for those who are Christ followers. Now, God causes the sun to shine on the evil and on the good. And he brings rain on the evil and on the good. Those are what we would call common grace. There are grace, there's grace that's offered to everyone that lives on this planet, and everyone that God has created. Right? But there are spiritual blessings that come with being a follower of Christ, and that's really what he's talking about here. And he's saying here, stay in the same house, heal the sick, and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. So who else followed and ministered with Jesus? Very quickly, we're not going to read the passages now, but there, there were women who had been healed, right? Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Herod's household uh, manager, Susanna, and there were many, many others. And there were acquaintances and the women who had followed him from Galilee. Now let's ask the question, and I think you've got these lines on your on your handout there. What are the marks of a true disciple? What are the marks of a true disciple? Well, Matthew, who has who has these passages? Let me just ask that. I think this is where we've got the passage there. Who, anybody have Matthew 10, 38, 39? And I know we have some that are not in hands, and that's okay. No? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so Matthew 10, 38, 39. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Okay, so basically whoever lives for the next life, that, that means denying yourself. It means taking up your cross, and it means following Jesus. It's, it's saying, I, my life has been overturned in a good sense, by God and for God's glory. And that's what God, that's how God has called me to live. And that means that when I make money, I want to use my money to build God's kingdom. And that can be done in a lot of different ways. I want to use my talents. I want to use my time. I want to structure everything in life 
to be used to build God's kingdom, right? I, rather than, than using everything that God has given me for my own self-benefit, I want to use it for the benefit of others, but not just to be nice, but for the goal of building God's kingdom, right? In Matthew 22, 36 to 40, we're going to keep moving through these right now. So those who generally fulfill these two great commandments, right? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and strength. And what's the second one? Yeah, to love your neighbor as yourself, right? That comes from Deuteronomy 6. John 8, those who abide in his word, because Jesus is the living word. So if we abide in Christ, we're abiding in God's word. And then John 15, 8 talks about those who bear much fruit. By, my, by this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. So if someone is claiming to be a Christian, and yet there's not visible fruit. Now, I don't mean you claim to be a Christian, or you profess Christ, and all of a sudden, bam, you've arrived. No, no discipleship works like that. No learning works like that. So that's not what we mean. But we do mean that there is a genuine and general growing hunger for the Word. There's a desire to, to, to increasingly be with God's people, to learn and to grow and to help one another. Right? These things mark what it means to be a Christian. Okay, so what is Jesus' strategy for his mission, to carry out his mission? Well, we'll see two things. Number one, it's to labor, and we'll talk about what that means, laboring in the lives of those he called. He said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. There's work there. Every time the disciples are following Jesus and they don't believe what he said or, or he says something and they are totally befuddled, there's work involved there for Jesus. He's teaching them. He's patiently explaining. He's walking along doing life with them. He doesn't respond to everything that they think they need immediately, right? Think about when Lazarus died. He came in his own time. And he got there, and they kind of reprimanded him. How come he didn't come faster? He'd still be alive. Right? And he talks about the Lord's timing. Lazarus has been there, what, four days? Four days? And he kind of stops, like, before he raises Lazarus, he, he, Lazarus, he kind of stops, and he disciples them. He shepherds them through it. And then what does he do? He's, he raises them. But before he did that, he weeps. So, he comes in his own time, or the Father's time, right? Because I do the will of my Father. So, Jesus comes in the Father's time. He shepherds those who are concerned that he didn't come sooner. And then, next scene, right? If curtain opens and closes, let's say, in between every scene, right? Or I guess that would be an act, right? So, curtain closes and opens, next scene, Jesus wept. He's teaching us something about himself in that. Next scene, Lazarus come out. Right? So he is laboring. He is definitely laboring in the lives of these few that he called. And he's making them into missional people by being with them. What he's showing them is how to be missional. And he appointed the twelve, whom he also named apostles, that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach. But before he sent them, he was with them, teaching them. Intimacy with Jesus fuels the mission, and any successful discipleship ministry will, must involve being with people in an intentional way, just as Jesus was with his followers. Now, there are differing intensities of discipleship. On Sunday morning, when the Word of God is preached, that is a form of discipleship, right? It, it's accurate to say because discipleship involves knowledge transfer. It involves teaching. But beyond that, it's, it's God's Word being spoken where the Holy Spirit is doing the, the work in the heart. And so there's discipleship happening but we're called to do far more than only to preach the Word of God. 
right? As we move deeper into the house, right, uh, if you will, remember that analogy from a few weeks ago, that word picture from a few weeks ago, uh, you move into uh, another deeper level of connecting than just saying hello here at church or talking with somebody in the community. You move into something that might be akin to community groups where you're coming in together. There maybe wasn't um, a whole lot that was required in, in a homework sense before that particular week begins, but you come in and there's fellowship and there's food and you're talking and that creates an environment for someone to come in and feel and know the love of God's people and say, oh, I can be a part of this group. I was talking with a community group leader recently, just in the last couple months, who said that, you know, they had some new folks join their community group and said they've never experienced anything like this. What a wonderful um, comment to hear. I, I've never experienced a relationship like this where we can come in and have this kind of conversation and pray for each other and <coughs> hurt with each other and laugh with each other and just fellowship in a different context. It's different than a business party or a business get-together, or something that's at the clubhouse. Why? Well, because the Holy Spirit is in it and above it and through it in all of our lives. Does that make sense? And that is necessary and huge. And, and that, can, that can help people prepare for moving into something like Life on Life Missional Discipleship. Now, does somebody have to go through, we are talking about pathways a few weeks ago, would somebody need have to go through a community group to join a journey group, let's say. Well, no, it wouldn't have to. Could it be good for somebody to? Absolutely. But do they have to? Well, no, they don't. But they do need to understand what, you know, what the cost is for life on life missional disaster. They do need to understand, you know, the, the, the time commitment and the workload involved because it's different. It's intentionally different. Does that make sense? Uh, you may want to be a part of a life on life group or a journey group, and it may just not be the right season. It, it, it may depend on the age of your kids. It may depend on just commitments that you have in life in general. It may depend on circumstances. I mean, there's so many things. So we would be wrong to say, okay, this is the path to true godliness, and these are secondary. That's not true, and that's not what we want to convey in any way, shape, or form. Does that make sense? We're saying there are different ways or different intensities of discipling and discipleship. Right? But intimacy with Jesus or intimacy with relationship with the ones discipling are necessary for any discipleship ministry that's going to be successful. Does that make sense? Okay, so what makes Life on Life Mission or Discipleship so unique? I'm going to holler out some passages. If you have it, just raise your hand. So I'm going to, I'm going to actually, do I have them all listed here? No. Well, that's what we're going to talk about. Who is Matthew 4, 19 to 22? Okay. Can you just uh, read that quickly? And if you have an answer, throw it out. If you don't, just give me that look that I know what it communicates, and we'll, we'll go on there. And he, said to, and he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Okay, so I missed up my PowerPoint, so the answer is already on the screen. Right? Disciples followed in order to become fishers of men. Which means as we're inviting people in, we want to talk about what it means to be willing in God's time and with God's help and equipping to be willing to lead others. But everybody is called to be a fisher of men, right? Every Christian is called to be a fisher of men. Okay, Matthew 28. Anybody have that one? That one we know pretty well. We're going to, if we don't have it, that's okay. Disciples were entrusted with the mission, right? Making disciples, baptizing them, teaching them what? Some stuff? What? What was that next phrase? All that I have commanded you. That's a pretty uh, well-rounded discipleship ministry program. Teach them all that I have commanded you. That conversation on the road to Emmaus is often what people think about there. And he, he explained to them everything from the prophets. Um, okay, Luke 2.52. Anybody have that? Wisdom and in stature and of, and 
favor with God and all the people. Yeah, so there's this um, season, actually I'm going to reference, it's funny how my sermons are lining up with this largely too, but um, there's this season that, that's kind of um, seen as the silent years of Jesus, as he's growing up, right? He's born, and we know he lives a perfect life, he's growing up. And as he's growing up, he's growing in his knowledge, he's developing his character. The Bible says that his uh, obedience came through his suffering, or through his, um, I'm forgetting the exact phrase I'm thinking of, he grows in his values, or, or shall we say, in the human application of God-centered values. Don't forget, Jesus didn't do an end around. He lived a perfect life. He took the values of the Father and of the kingdom, and he put them into practice. And he grew in favor with man. Luke 6.40 tells us this. Anybody have that one? A disciple is not about his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. Now just pause for a minute. In a sense, in a broader sense, it means that a Christian will become like Christ. Right? Never perfect, but striving for that. But, how many of us can talk about those who discipled us and how we became a lot like them. Some of us were fortunate to have people really disciple us heavily. I, I told you a few weeks ago when we started, I was very fortunate to have a few men invest in me heavily when I was in college. I didn't go seeking it, like, boy, I need to grow as a godly man, and so I need to find somebody to disciple me. And, but I know people who have. That just wasn't where I was at. But by God's grace and His, and His sovereignty, he put me in a place where there were some men who really poured into me. And there's a lot that I do today, the way that I preach, the way that I lead Bible studies, the way that I uh, even do hospitality, the way that we welcome people in our home and things like that. I don't mean that it's absent of Sherilyn there, obviously. It's, it's, and then we combine how she does it and how I do it. And as we grow, you begin to see character traits, right? It's just like, as an adult, you, you may do something. You'd be like, oh, that was my dad. Or, oh, that was my mom. Right? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Or your kids. Your kids do it. And maybe your spouse points out, like, oh, that he or she is, that's just what you do right there. Or you roll just like that. <laughs> or, I don't know, you know, it's not all bad traits. It's great traits, too, right? But we, we, we become like those that we spend time with. And in discipleship, that's what we're called to do. We're to spend time with Jesus. And as others spend time with us, by God's grace, they're going to become some like us. They're going to learn some things from us. And by God's grace, they're going to become more like Jesus. Acts 4.13. I'm going to keep moving. I have there. Okay, go ahead. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were under, uneducated common men, they were astonished and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. There's a transference of knowledge that happens. I love that phrase. They, they were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Now, they may not have been able to explain it, but they perceived Christ-likeness in character. Okay, Acts 4.22 talks about how life on life happens. Anybody have that passage? Life on life happens in the context of community. As they, now, now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but everything that they had was in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them, and they brought the proceeds of what was sold, and they laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to each as any had need. So there's huge context of community that happens. The Second Corinthians 3.18, anyone have that? I do. Okay. Can you read that? And we all with unveiled face equal in the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Being transformed from one glory to another. Colossians 1. 28, 29, anybody have that? So 
we tell others about Christ, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom. God has given us. We want to present them to God, perfect in their relationship to Christ. That's why I work and struggle so hard, depending on Christ's mighty power that works within me. So a different translation, but that we might present everyone mature in Christ. So maturity is the goal, not church attendance. Not even church attendance plus Sunday school attendance. Not even being able to recite all the Awana verses. Those things are good. They're a piece of the puzzle, but spiritual maturity, which means if you're going to encourage anyone to become a mature ball player, a developed ball player, there are disciplines that they have to develop or they're never going to be a mature ball player, right? Or athlete or painter or whatever the case might be. There are fundamentals that have to be developed in order for us to be mature in Christ. And that's what uh, Life on Life helps to walk alongside someone to help them develop these things. You say, oh, there's a lot of homework. Well, it's not only homework. It's helping them learn how to study the Bible. It's helping them learn how to pray. Helping them learn the discipline of structuring your time and blocking off time to have time to spend in God's Word. 1 Thessalonians 2, 7 and 12, they shared their lives as well as the gospel. Right? You talked about that, I know, in, the, in uh, Downline Discipleship. And 2 Timothy 2, 1 through 2, there's an expectation of fourth generational reproduction. So here's our definition. Laboring the life, in the lives of a few with the intention of imparting one's life, God's word, and the gospel in such a way as to see them become mature and equipped followers of Christ, committed, conviction, committed to doing the same in the lives of others. Okay, now here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to hit 12 principles. I'm not expecting you to have all this memorized here. I think you have some blanks to fill these out. I'm going to hit 12 principles of life on life missional discipleship. And then I'm going to, I'm going to like spend the rest of our time in groups discussing several questions. You won't have time maybe to discuss all of them, but the first principle is this. This was Jesus' plan, and we're to become like our master. Jesus did it. He didn't have a plan B. This was his plan. He didn't say, uh, hey, guys, do this, but if by chance it doesn't work, I've hidden something for you over here that can be your plan B. No, no, no. This is what it was. This is what he calls us to do. And he commands all true followers to make disciples. Number two, Christ's love compels us to disciple others with the motivation of gratitude and love. Three, it was taught and it was practiced by Christ's disciples. So you see what's happening here. Jesus did it. He had no plan B. And then, amazingly, those he discipled did it. Those Jesus discipled discipled others. Number four. There are examples implicitly where we just see by examples, not necessarily a teaching on discipleship, but also explicitly in Scripture, right? God disciples his people. When you think about God walking with Adam and teaching Adam, when you think of, of God rebuking people even, uh, when you think of all of these kinds of Old Testament relationships we see, right? God discipled his people. People disciple people, and God walks with his people. Think about Jesus being incarnate, which we've just been talking about. Number five, it is the most effective way to complete our assignment as a church and as discipleship as disciples, as our goal is to see fourth generational disciples. Just pause and think about that. Fourth generational disciples. Someone disciples me. That's one, that's two, and then I disciple someone else, who in turn disciples someone else. I know in Downline Discipleship, at least in one of the weeks, you looked at that multiplication versus addition. I think there was an animation, a little video about that, right? Uh, and so we don't have time to chase that down right now, but multiplication is far better in even not too many years down the road than simple addition is. Does that make sense? Um, 
But that's not even the reason why we're doing it. That just proves the point. All right, number six. It exposes our unbiblical practice of elevating laity or paid pastors. I said laity, clergy. Paid pastors above all disciples in the building of God's church. What is my, or what is the elders as a whole, what is our primary job description? Equip. Equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Now that doesn't mean, you know, it's our job to equip you and then you go do it and we sit back. No, we're all in the work together. But our job is to equip you to do it, not to do it for you. To equip you so that you can do it. Because God has called everyone to do it. And so when we expect the pastors, the elders to do it, it's an unbiblical expectation. It reduces our, our long-term need for expensive, time-intensive, and often ineffective programming. It doesn't mean we won't ever do any programming, but what it says is we are placing the emphasis for all we do on making disciples in a comprehensive manner, using more than one uh, simple technique, if you will, more than one vehicle. They each accomplish different aims in the discipling process. Does that make sense? But this is a must in the process. Number eight, it offers the best way to foster high accountability in a safe environment of grace and truth and growth. We'll talk in the coming weeks about what does grace-centered accountability look like. We've done some studies on it. Last year we did the, the cross-centered life, or gospel-centered life. And so what does it look like to have accountability that's not just, hey, pull yourself up by your riches, you know? Number nine, it creates an environment for careful pastoral insight and care. There are a lot of needs that, as, as pastor elders in the church, that we just can't handle them all well. Number one, just to state them super obvious, there are gender-specific needs that guys, <laughs> no clue. That ladies, godly ladies, can disciple ladies through. And, and same conversely, that godly men can disciple godly men through. But it gives leadership touch points for everybody in the church so that we can be in communication with community group leaders and with life on life journey group leaders to see how people are doing. Trusting these leaders that are in place to be caring for their souls and discipling and, and shepherding. Three more, it preserves the fruit of evangelistic efforts. When somebody becomes a Christian through somebody sharing their faith, they are swept into an environment of care and community and teaching. So they're not just making a profession of faith and then we're waving and saying hello on Sunday mornings. It produces leaders. Right? It's a leadership development shoot, if you will. It's a track for equipping leaders over the process of a couple years. And it's personal and it's relational, just as God is personal and relational with us. Okay, now here's what I want to encourage you to do. First of all, let me just punctuate the point that I was making at the beginning. I tried to get through that about as fast as I could. Now, some of that is on me for maybe probably choosing too much content for this morning. Uh, and that's, that's the challenge when you have an hour uh, to work through some things. But can you imagine if we had all done all of this study independently? And some of you did. And for those of you who didn't, it's not because you're slackers. It's because we came into this saying some people are going to do the homework because it's what you're looking toward. And some, some of you have lives that are full doing other things for the kingdom. So it's not a guilt trip if you did it. That's fine. But had we all done it, we came in right out of the gates and we began with this question, what does it mean to labor in the lives of a few? Right? So here's what I want to ask you to do in the next, just take five minutes and group up in, say, three groups. And you've got a list of about seven. Do you have these questions on your sheets? Yes. Yes? yes. Okay. 
pick one question. That's all we have time for right now. But this week, be thinking about these questions. What is the significance of laboring in the lives of a few? You can't do it with everybody. Okay? So go ahead and break up into three groups. Um, take one question and maybe just talk about that question. Does that make sense? And then uh, I'll let you guys close in prayer in your groups, and then we'll transition out of the work down to the worship service from there. Okay?